Chapter Thirteen of the Shortstop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Rowdy Delaney, Idaho, USA. The Shortstop by Zane Gray. Chapter Thirteen. Sunday Ball. Say, sure, I got something to tell you, Indians, that I ain't stuck on, said Mac. The directors have decided to play Sunday ball. The boys could not have made a more passionate and angry outbreak if they had heard they were to be hanged. Beef, beef, shouted Mac, red as a lobster. Haven't I been again it? You puff in front of the hotel stiffs talk as if I was to blame. What? roared Castorius. Give me my release, cried Benny who had recently taken to attending a certain church. Benny never did anything by halves. The dude flung his bat through a window, carrying away glass and sash. All except Chase were violent in word and action, and he was too greatly surprised to move or speak. Mac's position often assumed exasperating phases. This was one of them. He tried reason on the most choleric of his players with about as much success as if they had been brass mules. They persisted in venting their spleen on him. Then he lost his temper. Flannel mouths! Have you all swallowed red-hot bricks? Cheese it now! Cheese it! The guy that doesn't report here Sunday gets let down, and fine besides. Got that? Chase left the grounds in some distress of mind. The past four weeks had been so perfect that he had forgotten things could go wrong. Sunday ball! It had never occurred to him. To give up his place on the team and all the bright promise of the future, he could not consider for a moment. He would have to reconcile himself to the inevitable. But what would his mother say? He might keep it from her. He did not need to tell her. She never would find it out. No, the temptation lasted only a moment. He would not deceive her. And then a further consideration weighed upon him. If he played baseball on the Sabbath in order to attain a future success, would that success be an honest one? He was afraid it would not. He had been trained to respect the Sabbath. If he kept faith with his training, he must confess Sunday games were wrong. Nevertheless, he could not harbor the idea of resigning his place. This made him feel he was willfully doing wrong, and he plunged into bitterness of spirit. It was with no little curiosity that Chase went out upon the field on Sunday. The grandstand looked as usual. Many familiar faces were there. The bleachers were packed, and a line of men and boys, twenty deep, extended along to the right and left of the diamond. Chase had never seen such a crowd in the grounds, nor had he ever seen such enthusiasm. All at once it occurred to him that there were hundreds and thousands of boys and men who worked every daylight hour six days in the week. They were new to him, and he saw that he was as new to them. They had never seen him play. They had never before had a chance to see a ball game in Findlay. A question came naturally to Chase's quick mind. Had they played the game when they were mere tots on the commons and learned to love it as he had? A blind man would have answered in the affirmative. They were wild and bubbling over from sheer joy. If they loved the game and had only one day to go, albeit that day was Sunday, were they doing harm? Chase could not answer that. But he knew whatever it was for them applied also to him. Findlay won the first Sunday game. A greater and noisier crowd had never been in attendance. Noise! The field was howling bedlam. The boys ran like unleashed colts. The men cheered their own players, roared at their opponents, and at each other. In his heart Chase was trying desperately hard to justify his own part in it, and because of that he saw much and found food for reflection. Well he knew the pallor of these boys. It came from the dark, sunless foundries. The hundreds of men present had a yellowish, oily look. They were the diggers and refiners, the laborers from the oil fields. At first Chase thought their unbridled mirth, their coarse jests at the umpire, at the players, and themselves, their unremitting wild, 
hoarse yells as unnatural as strident. Then, suddenly, a smile here, a laugh of delight there, told him all this was only natural. These men and boys had found expression for their pent-up feelings, for a short delight in contrast to the long day. This was their hour of freedom. Yell, that's right, yell, muttered Chase through his teeth as he went to bat. He felt for them, but he could not quite understand. He drove one of his famous liners against the fence. Yell for that, he said to himself. A long, screeching, swelling howl of rapture rose from the fields and stands. It rang in Chase's ears as he sped round the bases, and when, after sliding into third, he stood up, he saw a sight he never forgot. The crowd was one leaping, tossing, waving, crazy mass. With Chase, to get the track of anything was to trail it to the end. The faces and actions of that crowd made him think. Their frenzied glee made him sad, because it reminded him of his old longing for freedom, and its very violence bespoke the bottled-up love of play. These men and boys wanted to play, and circumstances made it so they could not. They loved to play, as they had mothers, sisters, brothers, children, to support, they had no time to play. As the next best thing, they loved to see someone else play. And they had only one day, Sunday. It's this way, said Chase to himself. If these men and boys spend their Sundays at home and in church, then Sunday ball is wrong. If they spend it otherwise, then Sunday ball is not wrong. Chase was tenacious and stubborn. He found he loved the game as a boy because of the play in it. Now he loved it because of what it was doing for him, because he believed in it, and he set himself to find out what it might be doing for others. He could not write to his mother until he had decided the question. So he spent much of his leisure time going the rounds of the foundries, factories, refineries, brickyards, and he took care to drop into all the saloons, the beer gardens, and dance halls. Everywhere he was known and welcomed. He asked questions, he listened, and he watched. When another Sunday had passed, he was in possession of all he needed to know. With immeasurable relief, he decided that, while he would rather not play Sunday ball, it was not wrong for him to do so. He even decided he was doing good. Thus he settled the perplexing question forever in his own conscience. He would tell his mother how he had arrived at his conclusion, and as for others, it did not matter what they thought. All this time Chase had not been blind to certain indications of coolness on the part of people who had hitherto been pleased to be courteous and affable. And as these indications came solely from chance meetings in the streets, he began to wonder how much deeper their coolness would go, provided he sought the society of these persons. That thought alone kept him away from Marjorie for over a week. He believed she would understand, and still be his friend. But instinctively he feared her mother, and he had a momentary twinge when he called to mind the young minister so welcome in the Dean household. One evening, when a party of ladies coolly snubbed him, Chase could stand the suspense no longer. So he presented himself at Marjorie's home and much to his relief found her on the porch alone. "'Chase, Mama has forbidden me to see you,' she said, with her blue eyes on him. Chase gulped when he saw the eyes were unchanged, still warm and bright. "'No? Oh, Marjorie, it's not so bad as that.' "'Yes. But, Chase, you just give up the Sunday games, and then everything will be all right.' "'I can't do that. Why not? Let them play without you.' It's no use, Marjorie. Either I play on Sundays, or I give up the game. And it means a good deal to me. Does your mother say it's wrong? She says it's awful. And Mr. Marsden held up his hand in holy horror when he heard it. He's going to work against it. Stop it. Do you think it's so terribly wrong? Oh, Chase, for you to ask me that. Don't you know it? No, I don't, replied Chase, stubbornly. Then you won't give it up. No, not, not even to please me? I would if I could, but I can't. Marjorie, please, then good-bye. Oh, 
cried Chase sharply. He looked at her. The long lashes were down. You've said that as if I were— Look here, Marjorie Dean. I'm working for my mother. I've seen her faint when she came home at night. I've seen her hands bleed. If every day were Sunday and baseball bad, which it's not, I'd play. What do I care for Mr. Marsden? He's so dry he rattles like a beanstalk. I don't care what your mother thinks. She's— I don't care what— what you think, either. Good-bye, he strode off the porch. A low, tremulous chase did not halt him. He was bitterly hurt, angry, and sick. He went to his room, fought out his bad hour alone in the dark, and then came forth, feeling himself older and resigned. But he was more determined than ever to stand by the game. Sunday another great throng yelled itself hoarse at the grounds, and went home in shirt-sleeves, sweaty, tired, and happy. Chase dressed, went to dinner, and then strolled round to the hotel. All the boys were there, lounging in familiar groups. He thought they all seemed rather quiet, and looked queerly at him. Before he learned what was in the air, a policeman, whom he knew well, stepped up reluctantly. Chase, I've got a warrant for you. The blood round Chase's heart seemed to freeze. He stared, unable to speak. My partner has gone to arrest Mac, continued the officer. Here's the warrant. The printed words blurred in Chase's sight, but his own name in writing, and the term Sunday Baseball, and the Reverend Marsden's name, told him the meaning of the arrest. I'm sorry, Chase. I hate to run you in, but I've my duty, said the officer and whispered lower, "'We'll try to get word to Mayor Duff, so you can get bail and not be locked up.' "'Bail? Locked up?' echoed Chase, stupidly. Mac appeared with another officer. The little manager was pale, but composed. "'Sure, we're pinched, Chase,' he said, and as the players crowded round, he continued, "'Fade away now, or you'll put people wise. Somebody hunt up King and Beekman, Send him to the station. Cass, you dig for Mayor Duff's house, and ask him to come take bail for us. Lord, I hope he's home. If not, the law puts us in a cell to-night. Sure, somebody has done us dirt. Them warrants might have been made out for to-morrow. Mac, you and Chase walk round to the station alone, said one of the officers. We'll go another way. Thanks. Sure, you're all right, replied Mac. Come on, Chase. Don't look so peaked. "'Isn't the whole team arrested?' queried Chase. "'Sure, and the whole team will be on trial, but the warrants read, for manager and one player. It'd be more regular to have pinched Enoch, as he is captain. Don't know why they picked out you. Is playing on Sunday against the law? Nah, not any more than driving a team, but these moss-backed people twist things and call us a nuisance and immoral and Lord knows what. Here we are at the station.' It's pretty tough on you, kid, but don't quit. This won't hurt you any. The two officers met them, unlocked the station house doors, and ushered them into the mayor's office. Presently, Beekman strode in, big and important, and said it was not necessary to call in King, for he would go bail for both. If Duff's in town, he'll come, continued Beekman. Presently, the sounds of a fast trotting horse and flying wheels drew an officer to the window. The mayor's here, he said. Mac settled back with a deep breath. Good, he exclaimed. A tall man with a gray beard came in hurriedly, followed by Castorius. He nodded to all, threw his gloves on the desk, and took the warrants held out to him. In a few moments he had made the necessary recording of the arrests and of accepted bail. Then he shook hands with Mac and Chase. Glad I happened to run into Castorius was driving out into the country. You'll get your hearing tomorrow morning, and if you wish, I'll set the trial for Wednesday or Thursday morning. The sooner the better, replied Mac. Then the mayor bowed pleasantly and left. Chase followed the others out. He could scarcely realize that he had been arrested, and leaving his friends in earnest conversation, he went to his room and to bed. He did not have a very restful night. The morning papers were full of the particulars of the arrest and the consideration of Sunday ball, and the subject was the absorbing topic of conversation everywhere. 
all the directors of the team were present at the hearing, and afterwards repaired to Judge Meg's office to discuss the matter of defense. Meggs was a shrewd old lawyer, and incidentally an admirer of the game of baseball. While in office, he had been known to adjourn court because he wanted to see Findlay wallop their rivals. Therefore it was felt that with the case in his hands the team would escape imprisonment and fine even if Sunday ball were discontinued. Beekman and King had visited practically all the men of business in Finley, and stating their case, that the Sunday game was conducted in an orderly manner, that no drinks were sold at or near the grounds, that it was played at the earnest request of thousands of working men and boys, had gotten a long list of signatures to their petition favoring the game. During the discussion as to the defense, one of the directors had mentioned the fact that certain members of the laboring class were better off in summer for the playing of the game. "'Can you prove that?' asked Judge Meggs. "'I know it's true,' spoke up Chase. "'How do you know?' returned the lawyer. Somewhat incoherently, but with the eager earnestness of conviction, Chase told what he knew. Then the judge questioned him in regard to his motive drew him out to tell what baseball meant to him and to others like him with the result that he presently said to the directors gentlemen we have our defense and you can take my word for it we shall win he asked chase to call at his office an hour before the time fixed upon for the trial next day findlay lost the ball game that afternoon they played listlessly and plainly showed the effects of the cloud hanging over them on Wednesday, Chase went to Judge Meg's office at the appointed time. Now, Chase, if you were a star of the diamond, you ought to shine just as brightly in the courtroom. This morning, when I call on you, I want you to get up and tell the court what you told me about yourself and baseball. Be simple, earnest, and straightforward. You have here the opportunity to vindicate yourself and your fellow players, so make the best of it. Chase went to the courtroom with the judge. It was crowded with people. The Findlay team and the team visiting town at the time occupied front seats. All the directors and many businessmen were present. There was a plentiful sprinkling of ladies in the background. Mayor Duff opened the proceedings as soon as the judge arrived with Chase. The prosecuting minister did not appear. His representative, a young lawyer, rose and expatiated on the evils of the Findlay team in general, and of Sunday Ball in particular. These young men set bad examples, engendered idleness and love of play. They were opposed to work. They enticed boys from school to see a useless and sometimes dangerous sport. They fostered the spirit of rivalry and gambling. Baseball on Sunday was an abomination, and it was a desecration of the Sabbath. It added to the undermining of the church. It opposed the teachings of the Bible. It kept the boys and girls from Sunday school. Sunday was a day of rest, of prayer, of quiet communion, not a day for playing, howling, yelling, mobbing, carousing. The permitting of the game was a disgrace to the decent name of Finley, a shame to her respectable citizens, and a sin to her churches. The prosecution examined witnesses, who swore to endless streams of passing men on the streets, of yelling that made the afternoon a hideous nightmare, of brawls on corners and mob violence in the ball-grounds, of hoodlums accosting women, and there the prosecution rested. Judge Meggs read the petition and the names of the men who signed it and he said there could be little doubt of the great benefit Finley had derived in a business way from the advertising given to it by the baseball team. Your Honor, he concluded impressively, I will now have one of the defendants tell his experience of baseball. At a word from Judge Meggs, Chase stepped forward. His face was white, his eyes dark from excitement, but he appeared entirely self-possessed. Your Honor, I am eighteen years old, and have played baseball as long as I can remember. I learned in the streets and on the lots of Akron. When I was twelve years old, I left school to support my mother and a crippled brother. I sold papers, did odd jobs, anything that offered. I had a crooked eye then, and it was hard for me to get a place. People didn't like my looks. 
At fourteen, I went to work in a molding department of a factory. I studied at night to try to get some education. When I had been there a year, I earned five dollars a week. After four years, I was earning six dollars a week. I did not advance fast. Last summer, I played ball on the factory team. This spring, I decided to be a ball player. My mother opposed me, but I persuaded her. I started out to find a place on a team. My crooked eye was against chances of success. I became a tramp and beat my way from town to town. I starved, but I hung on. One morning I awoke in a fence corner. A woman I spoke to said the town nearby was Findlay. I hunted up the ball grounds and the manager. He didn't see my ragged clothes or my crooked eye. He gave me a chance. I played a wretched game. I expected to be thrown from the grounds. He gave me money, said he would keep me, would teach me the game. I tried hard, and I made good. I have been happy here in Findlay. I never knew what friends meant. Everybody has been kind to me. I have dreamed of one day being a businessman here. But best for me was what I could do for my mother and brother. She does not take in washing any more, or sew herself blind late into the nights. My brother has had treatment for his hip. He has the books he needed, and he will get the education he longs for. When I learned we were to play Sunday ball, I was stunned. I never thought of that. My mother gave me Christian teaching, and I kept the Sabbath day. I was sick with doubt. I felt that I was going to do wrong. I concluded that it would be wrong, but I had no mind to sacrifice my place on the team. That had been too dearly bought. It meant too much to me. My mother had to be told, and there lay the reason for my seeking some excuse. It came to me in the first Sunday game. There were five hundred men and boys who had never attended one of our games. No one ever saw a wilder crowd. It was as if they had been let out of an asylum. They were crazy, but it was with happiness. They screamed like Indians, but it was for freedom. I saw men smash their hats, boys throw their coats, and both yell with tears in their eyes. Why? Your Honor, I will tell you why. I know what it means to work from daylight to night, year in, year out, with no chance, no hope for the natural play every man and especially every boy loves. It is very easy for ministers and teachers to tell us working men how to spend the one free day, and no doubt they mean well, but they miss the point. On Sunday, those shrieking, boisterous diggers, cappers, puddlers, refiners had gone back to their boyhood. They played the game for us with their hearts, their throats, their tears. The night after that game I had a change of feeling. I began to think, perhaps after all, it was not so bad for me to play ball on Sunday. I began to see things I had never seen before. If I could satisfy myself that the hundreds of men and boys were better off at a Sunday game than elsewhere, then I was justified in playing for their amusement. So I began to go round and ask questions. At first, this searching for the truth was because of what I must tell my mother. Afterwards, the thing itself interested me. I went to the foundries and factories, to the big refineries, to the brickyards, everywhere, and I found everybody knew me, everybody had a word for me, everybody's eyes shone at the mention of the next Sunday game. I talked to little boys and girls carrying dinner to their fathers, and I went home with them and talked to their mothers. One and all, these mothers welcomed the game. I visited the saloons and beer gardens, the roadhouses and the dance halls. I found them bitterly opposed to Sunday ball. Their Sunday business was ruined. Two big gardens closed up after the second Sunday. I had seen some of these places when in full blast on a busy Sunday. The beer ran in streams, and the air reeked. It seems to me those who make the laws would learn something if they became mere hard-working men. When their eyes burned in their heads, and their backs ached, and they never saw the sky, and grew dull and weary, they would see differently. They wouldn't ask any man to sit in church and be told how to be good and happy. A man or a boy, pinned up all week, needs some kind of fling. Your Honor, 
I wrote my mother that I was not doing wrong when I played Sunday ball. I am not ashamed of it. We players are not a disgrace to Findlay. Chase sat down. Judge Meg stroked his chin and watched his honor, while the crowd roared their applause. Finally, Mayor Duff rapped on his desk. I am sitting in judgment on this case as Mayor of Findlay as deacon of the church bringing the action and as director of the findlay baseball association i am rather submerged in the deep sea between the two sides but i am happy to say that as mayor church member and director i have solved the problem i do not want to go on record as agreeing entirely with alloway still so far as he is concerned i uphold him more than that he has given us something to think about I have long had my eye on those halls and gardens he spoke of, and now they shall be closed on Sunday. During the last few days I have visited every prominent business concern in Findlay, and I have laid before each this baseball situation. In substance, I said I would permit Sunday ball unless they gave their employees a half-holiday on Saturdays. I have spoken of Finley's prosperity, and that no small factor in the activity of business for the last few years has been the advertisement of our crack baseball team. I have gone to the different leaders of the churches and of society, and I have solicited their cooperation, assuring them that if they would join forces with me for the good of Finley and the laboring classes and the baseball people, there need be no Sunday ball. I am happy to say that I have been entirely successful. There will be no Sunday ball. There will be no open shops or factories or mills on Saturday afternoons. We, all of us, working people, church people, everybody concerned, will profit by this. How much better it is for the baseball team to have the undivided support of Findlay. That is what it will have now. Findlay is proud of its baseball team and it is proud of some other things its prosperity its good name its old-fashioned institutions we want still to have the quiet serene sundays our fathers and mothers had i think it is to the credit of finley that we can meet this question and settle it to everybody's satisfaction i am sure the matter has been wholesome for us as a city and as individuals so i am happy to dismiss the case assuring the prosecution and the defense that they have both won and that their victory is in every way an advance a betterment for the commonwealth of findlay End of chapter thirteen